So what comes to your mind when the word outer space is mentioned? I don't know. But I know that I flew from Nairobi yesterday evening. And we flew at about, I believe about um, three kilometers above sea level at the highest. We did about 30,000 meters, I believe. I imagined that I was on space. But was I in outer space? Sixty years since the first man landed on the moon, astropolitics, also known as the geopolitics of outer space, is entering a new dawn in these recent times. Technological development and recent successes of ambitious space programs such as SpaceX, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic are bringing outer space and the moon back to the geopolitical debate. The foundation of activities in outer space finds its roots in the Cold War and reproduces the distinctive geopolitical dynamics of that historical moment. The diverging interests between the two states, the United States and Russia, were reflected in the political tensions that characterized the competition to reach outer space. Today, new players are emerging, including non-state actors. So, what is the domain for space regulation? What are the rules of engagement in a largely evolving landscape in the wake of new terms such as space colony, space force, space tourism, and space economy? These issues are reflected in increasing legislation adopted to regulate space activities on a national and continental level. Furthermore, space activities are relevant for the well-being of humankind. Many services provided by public and private companies such as satellite broadcasting, weather forecasts or satellite navigation have a strong socio-economic impact. A great reference point is the development of space in Africa. Today, Africa is looking to space to meet the rising demand for connectivity, fueled by fast-changing data consumption patterns and the growing need to bridge the digital divide by leveraging the non-terrestrial networks, NTNs. By April 2019, eight African countries including Kenya, Ghana, Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, South Africa and Angola had launched 32 national satellites into the orbit according to the annual African Space Industry Report 2020. Can we start with you, Dave? What is outer space? Um, thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> it is a very <laughs> pertinent question that has been asked uh, since 1957, and uh, one which uh, a number of states and even individuals still debate up to this day. Um, the general consensus is that uh, uh, space should begin uh, about 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers above sea level. Uh, but still that fluctuates depending on who is counting. So, uh, <laughs> but, but the general idea and what is generally accepted as space is everything that is above uh, an area called the common line. And uh, the common line uh, is believed to be at about 100 kilometers. Though, of course, uh, because the delineation is very important pol politically, it can, it can vary. Uh, some, some, uh, some entities would, would assume that the common line is at about 80 kilometers. Others would assume it should be about 50, depending on uh, the agenda that is being pushed. But generally, space is believed to be uh, between 50 and 100 kilometers. Uh, above sea level, so that's where you are now talking about outer space. So if you traveled at uh, 30,000 feet, uh, you were pretty much within airspace. <laughs> I was just within yes, airspace. airspace. I'm that really disappointed, not, man. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was still airspace. But why is that definition um, important, Philip? Um, well, for defini defini it's always necessary because um, most states have a certain amount of when you look at when you look at what they call land area now the land area of a state you would you would first and foremost 
go back and first look at what would, what would constitute a sovereign state. So you must have a land area, you must have territorial borders. Now these borders are not just land borders. As Mr. Casivante noted, when you are flying about three kilometers, you are in airspace. Now the question now becomes, whose airspace are you in? You, I, I think the, the, the have been, it has been shown in a couple of movies where they talk about how certain space shuttles or maybe a plane or uh, flies into another country's airspace and you have a sort of an international issue because, for example, if it's a fighter jet, maybe from Uganda and it flies into the Kenyan airspace, you could have a diplomatic issue at that point because the question is, why are you flying in our airspace with such threatening you know, aircraft? Right. So you, it's not, the definition is necessary because the way, in order to form a state, you need territorial boundaries. And these boundaries not only deal with the land boundaries, but even those that go to the sky. So there's a certain space to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about how many kilometers it is, but a certain air above the land in Uganda that is said to belong to Uganda. So it's necessary to have that definition. When someone tells you 80 kilometers past that, you know, 80 kilometers above, uh, above sea level, you know, past that, that's none of our concern. You've now stepped into a whole other realm altogether. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, that's a very, those are very interesting responses. I think um, the understanding of territoriality of a state um, based on the principle, I believe you guys must have learned just the way I did, the Roman law principle of, you know, cuius est solum, a use as to school ad coelum et ad inferus, which means whoever owns the terrestrial surface owns as high above that terrestrial surface and as low as the heavens, as high as the heavens. But apparently, according to David, you know, it can only be as high as about 80 kilometers above the terrestrial surface. You know, because beyond that, you're entering the outer space, which is the domain that is governed by different rules, which we shall hear about uh, in, a, in a short while. So this panel, ladies and gentlemen, seeks to engage with various questions. And the fundamental question for us is, what's the relevance of outer space in the socioeconomic and political development of Africa? Because at the end of the day, it's got to matter to Africa. This conversation around the geopolitics of it must matter to Africa. Does Africa have the critical capacities to leverage, own, and innovate around outer space in the furtherance of, the strategic in, of its strategic interests and objectives. Because when we talk about geopolitics, we are really talking about the interaction uh, and the mediation of interests um, of, various, you know, of various states. This panel will also discuss what is the current state of international law on outer space, and where are the gaps and challenges, as well as opportunities, you know, for Africa. And lastly, what critical infrastructures exist on the continent for use in outer space-related activities, amongst others. And so, um, to start us off uh, more formally, I wish to invite our colleague who is online um, our sister, Rania, uh, I believe she's already with us. Um, I want to request her to introduce herself in full, um, and then she has a presentation that she will make, uh, and we will listen very attentively uh, to our slides. Welcome again, uh, Rana, if you can hear us. I can hear you clearly. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm very glad to be with you today. Um, I've heard all the introductions today and the one of David was David actually is working with me for the United Nations Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, so it was really a pleasure to hear you all. So let me introduce myself. So my name is Rania Tukebidi. I'm Tunisian based in Germany. Uh, what I do is that I build spacecrafts, so satellites, uh, launchers. I worked so far on seven satellites of the European Space Agency. Uh, that are on space exploration, like satellites going to Jupiter, uh, Earth observation, satellite communication, all sorts of projects. 
And we are now uh, trying to build the Lunar Gateway. I think you heard about it, which is the new ISS, International Space Station. Uh, I'm also a regional coordinator for Africa and Space Generation Advisory Council, which is in support of the UN and uh, uh, United Nations a mentor for the Space for Women program, basically. Um, I'm also a space strategy consultant. I work. Uh, I worked uh, some time with the European Commission, and uh, I work also with several African countries to draft their national space program. Um, I can probably start with my my presentation. I'll be talking a little bit about the strategy, but as well from a perspective of an engineer or a space engineer. So. First of all, I'd like to introduce you briefly a Space Generation Adversary Council. So this is internal use. So we will just give you two slides of how, what it is, um, what we do, and so on, so that you, you know about it a little bit. So it is an organization that is in support of the United Nations that is represented in the whole world, six regions, 150 countries, and over 15,000 members all over the world. What we do is that we try to uh, involve youth so people between 18 to 35 years old to the space activities, uh, whether they are engineers, lawyers, biologists, all kind of fields that are interested working in space. So we try to create a network between the space agencies, the universities, the industry, and so on, and also the stakeholders to uh, involve space in our uh, Earth technology. So what we do is we have five pillars, we have five activities. So we do events, we do project groups, a professional development, scholarships, and UN-related activities, which is, I think you, you are um, a little bit uh, involved more in, in the policy side. So uh, we are um, uh, supporting the UN COPTIS meeting, so Committee of Peaceful Users of Outer Space that is happening once a year. So we try to provide recommendations through our workshops every year. So here, I just would like to um, give few definitions, if I may say, from my uh, perspective. So what is geopolitics in outer space? What does it have? What, what are the main points for geopolitics in outer space? So we have the space treaties, we have the lone space, we have the international cooperation and conflict and space exploration, international economics, and we have the impact of any contact of extraterrestrial intelligence. And here, this is quite a sensitive topic because here we talk a lot about the cyber threats about the cybersecurity that is gonna really change the whole uh, map of the um, you know of, of the countries because of the threats that we have, the leadership in space. So we have what we call a, a country, or what, how we define a country is really a leader in, in space, which is basically now the U.S. So uh, what, when they have a certain capabilities, either products or services in space and they have a demonstration of those activities, which means they have a clear framework, they have already some products on them, and they have already a solid space framework that are working on, on, um, on improvement, of course. So um, now maybe the thing that we all see is that um, the main space faring countries uh, are basically the ones that are leading the economy in the world, so which are basically the US, China and Russia. But now we see that in the outer space, it's becoming more and more serious. So our, our understanding that is a very important field that can change the socioeconomic of all the countries and can change the geopolitical uh, situation in the whole world. So now Russia, what is trying to do is that trying to collaborate with, with China, with other BRICS nations in order to reign the US forces. I think you all saw that China has started already their, um, their, their let's say, uh, space force, if I may use the word. Uh, they have already launched their uh, quantum uh, satellites. They have a lot of uh, satellites so far. They would like to, to send a constellation. They'd like to have their own space station. And of course, this is not the only thing. The Russia is investing a lot now in, in space, and which is also the case for the for, for the uh, United States. So it's important to understand the global situation in order to, to position ourselves and to know in which conditions we are going. So, but the point I'd like to add here is that the UN is trying their best to have the peaceful uses of uh, outer space, which is something if we lose, so it's going to be a complete mess. So, and you can maybe, our dear lawyers can explain a bit more this point. So this image is can define everything. <laughs> so here we have Africa, that is a row um, uh, land that we don't have basically 
a lot of major space programs, a part of some specific countries of South Africa, um, like um, Egypt, like Nigeria now, Ghana, uh, but the rest are still space consumers. So you can see over here all the all the um, investment from all the other spacefaring countries that are going more and more. So and we are now having uh, this wonderful map. So. It's also important to know and to recognize when we are already talking about space, we need to understand exactly what are our role, what is our role, uh, what are the main points to understand and what, what are the, the, the lines that we should not cross. So there are five international treaties in outer space, like you have defined. So we have some conventions for li liability for damage, for example, defined in 1972. We have registration of, the, of objects launched into outer space in 1975, we have the agreements, um, the, the lunar agreements and other celestial bodies like uh, um, like comets, for example, and asteroids, uh, which is has been launched, I think, in 1979. I'm not sure about the date, but I think around that, that uh, year. And we have, of course, the Treaty of Principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies launched in 1967. So these are the five international treaties, the main ones. It's still updated. We are still working. So during the UN caucus sessions, there is lots of discussion going on. What are the next steps in which, uh, uh, where we are going in the space exploration? Because now we talk about colonizing, if I'm going to use the word again, so moon and, and Mars. So this is quite dynamic. So we need to uh, be involved and to be part take part of these treaties and also to to take part of the discussion as well so how africa can explore the, the rise of space sector in the region and how we can use it let's say um, we have main challenges so these are the main challenges we try to um, go through through our earth technology so we have the food security the fast urbanization the degradation of the environment the socio-economic issues security and the growing population that need to be educated. So we have over 60% of youth that need to be educated and we have the level of education in Africa is not really too much compared to the other, the rest of the world. So a um, few examples of the socioeconomic issues, we have the health uh, issues, uh, the, the environment issues, um, uh, the, the um, several others related to, as you, as you can see here, the fast urbanization and degradation of the environment as well. So uh, this is becoming a very serious uh, issue all over the world, but mainly in Africa, it is something that we need really to address right now. I think you have already mentioned several panels, but we need really to understand how space technology can support in solving these challenges, as well as the growing population. And here we talk about uh, the agenda. So Africa has uh, an agenda and has specific goals to fulfill by 2030 and by 2063. These goals will try to solve the challenge I have just mentioned, and they do need really sustainable uh, solutions. Um, they need transformative and sound uh, solutions that will try to solve these issues urgently. In other words, instead of making them in 50 years like the other, other spacefaring countries, we need to make them less. So we need to understand how to do this, what kind of products, what kind of services we need to address, and how we can uh, use, let's say, the previous experiences we have, how we can co cooperate with the other space faring countries, and what we need really to do this. So how these space applications can solve the issues. So we have the successful implementation of the SDGs, with, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17, I think they had added uh, one more, so the 18 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. We do need to make an impact uh, through space uh, activities, so we don't need to just some, sometimes to launch uh, spacecrafts to the moon or to, to Mars, it will not help us a lot, like let's say for now, but we need to find any kind of space technology that can really solve uh, the issues that I have mentioned. So this is, for example, one of the issues I have also uh, forgot to mention here, which is the, the one of the water management that can be solved thanks to the satellite's data. Um, a quick analysis to the situation we have, we need to understand that we have a lot of strength points, we have opportunities as well as weaknesses and, and threats. So the, the strength is, um, okay, we have just three points over here, but it's important to mention them. We have a youthful population, we have over uh, uh, the half of the population is youth, 
which is a very good human capacity. So we can invest on them and we can really build ourselves uh, a local space industry. We need already some established uh, uh, players uh, that have already made a very good career in space, like South Africa, like I mentioned, Egypt and Nigeria. And we have strong social networks in African tradition and as well as we have a lot of uh, cooperation with Europe, uh, with US, with China, with Russia. We had made already a good path and we, we got a very good experience on that level. So the opportunities as well are, are many. So we have, um, as I said, uh, some experts uh, like uh, David, I see here, like a lot of you that are already making very good steps. Unfortunately, not all of them are already uh, in town, so in, in, in their country, so uh, because of the brain drain, but we have already some capacities that we need to invest and we can invest and we can have in order to create our space uh, industry. We have, we have the collaboration and partnerships uh, of the academia, business and, and not government, the PPP. And we have already some existing technology that we can use, uh, earth technology, like a lot of electronic. We have made a very good way on electronic uh, developments, on mechanical products and so on that we can use, of course, for space. Because after all, uh, a spacecraft or a satellite is a robot in space under certain technical requirements, of course. The weaknesses and threats are well known. So we have lack of human skills now. We have a lot of poverty, we have lack of funding. We don't have a very clear roadmap, to be honest. So either regionally or locally. So we need really to address that point very well. And of course, the threats are the same. Of course, we need a lot of uh, financial support and big financial uh, investment in space in a smart way, let's say, and to add, address very well the short term um, challenges, the medium term and the long term ones. So um, to understand how to create our framework, we need to understand how to go to the space industry in two areas that, are, that should go together, which are basically the space research and the space industry. The space research is, in other words, you have has been already there since 50 years. So we cannot hear the kind of space satellites or uh, um, that have been already there like since 30 years. And well, that would be obsolete completely in space. And we do need to understand how to make, um, how to address the governance of the space. So we need either a space agency or a center. In other words, a body that can manage the space activities in the country. We do need ground station um, capabilities, ground capabilities, what is called in, in, in uh, engineering ground station. So in order to, uh, to uh, use the space data, so either from our satellites or from other satellites that can really uh, um, get the data well and address it and, and you know um, use it for, for our applications. And of course, understand the space market and in order to, um, um, let's say, uh, have a clear idea of the current situation and the, the global ones, uh, regional and global ones. The goals we have are two main goals. So the goal one is to have certain products and services that can support decision makers to solve the challenges. And the second goal is to use indigenous space capabilities. So we need really down to work on, on a, a sustainable way to create our space program. We can, of course, rely on the cooperation for sure, but we need to create really a local space market that can be sustained over here. So the strategic actions, of course, I will not go all these points. So um, who is interested in space? What space application uh, can address specifically? So we, we have the like, user needs. So we have all of us, of course, we use the space technology every day. We use uh, the phones, the mobiles, the, 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 the PCs and so on. This is basically satellite data. We use the space um, services in order to strengthen the space mission technology. Uh, we use um, the, we develop this, the regional and international market through the sustainable development and to create a socio-economic, to, to develop a socio-economic situation. We try to promote the international cooperation through space exploration. We try to coordinate the space, African space arena in order to uh, benefit the planned uh, space activities and avoid uh, of, uh, or, or minimize the application of resources and, uh, and efforts. And by, here, as I said, so we need to rely a lot 
on the uh, cooperation in order to avoid repeating the same mistakes and reproducing what the other countries have had. So here there is a lot of analysis we need to make. There is um, a huge research that has already been launched, but it's still on paper. So we need really now to work on this locally for each country and of course, regionally on Africa side. So here, um, there are basically four main um, space applications that we need to address. The first one, we have the satellite communication application, navigation and position and, and space science and astronomy. So these ones are the most interesting for our we get them in a way to, um, to address the, the urgent needs the urgent challenges and in order to that this is going to help us a lot for the food security. It's going to help us a lot to get the, uh, the, um, the water problems that we have in Africa and to raise, of course, raise an awareness about how to use these uh, data satellites data. Of course. So the, the navigation and positioning. So here we use that every day. So we need to understand that, um, for example, for internet uh, connection in Africa is the worst. So we have only 28% in on urban areas and 6% in a rural area, which is compared to the other the rest of the world, which is nothing. So we have also the satellite communication that can address the disaster management process. And we have basically the space science and astronomy that can also um, support the, the building of the capacities, human capacities and uh, can support us for the economic development. So uh, these are mainly the four pillars of the space uh, applications that we need to address um, urgent uh, issues. So the conclusion is that we need to have basically a 10 year outcome or uh, a long term outcome in order to have um, a clear roadmap in order to have services and products. So if products are quite costly because of the the current economic situation, we have to go through the services that can be more interesting for us. And we have to use the existing uh, space technology. And we have, of course, to rely a lot on the cooperation and to understand very well the rights and duties and to be to, to pay attention. Of course, this is the work of the space lawyers that should pay attention to the space treaties and to the space convention that can uh, really uh, support the, the projects in the next 20 years or even more. So this is basically um, all what we have to present today. So um, if you're interested in SGAC, these are basically the, the how you can join us either um, on Twitter, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, uh, you can go through our website. Uh, so we try to support the youth, we try to mentor them and we try to create the link with the uh, space agencies and also supporting the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rana, Rania Tukobri uh, from uh, the Space Generation Advisory Council of the UN. Uh, we really appreciate your very detailed uh, and elaborate presentation that, that actually really touches most of the critical elements uh, that this panel is supposed to address itself to. What we will now do, ladies and gentlemen, is to drill down even further you know, on the issues. And so listening into what Rana was talking about, um, David, um, I think she started off by talking about the state of international law, but really by just laying out the treaties. What I'm interested in, or what this audience is interested in is, so we've got outer space there. In that competition between Russia, between uh, Russia and the US and China, the role of BRICS, what, is the what does the regulatory regime look like? And what are the principles that govern that regime? Yes, thank you very much. I think for us to understand uh, the regulatory framework, uh, we need to understand basically where did everything start from. So I'll give very, very briefly the very short history of space, basically. So the year is 1957. Uh, the world is still worried about the second atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And uh, Russia launches a satellite, Sputnik 1. And uh, because of the nature of what was happening at the time, the fact, the fact that the world was worried about an arms race, 
there was a, a, there was a lot of worry that Russia would extend what was happening on Earth to space. So the, the United Nations at the time went into a panic, if I could say. It was a panic, and they had a lot of bilateral uh, uh, um, uh, co conversations and, and agreements with Russia. And as a result of this, in 1958, with these bilateral uh, uh, conversations, at the time, the United States did not even have a space program. Uh, in 1959, the United Nations comes up with what we call the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And you can, from just that, you can understand where the idea of space came from, peaceful use of outer space. This particular committee currently has about 91 member states. And um, with two uh, key uh, bodies under it, we have the Scientific and Technological Subcommittee, and then the legal and, uh, and, and, and uh, policy subcommittee. So the scientific, that's the one that is mostly about uh, which satellite is going to do what. Now the legal, that is where all the, <laughs> all the fire really uh, goes down. This is where all the policies on space-related activities actually happen. This is where they are discussed. This is where countries come together and just agree. So this particular committee realizes that you see, simply uh, uh, looking, creating this committee was not enough. There needs to be laws. Because states are governed by laws, and these laws are what we now call treaties, where states come together and agree, all of them, that this is what we are going to be governed with from now on. So because of the threat of nuclear weapons, in 1963, we have the very first space treaty. This was the, the ban of nuclear weapons Treaty, 1963, and this treaty simply banned all nuclear weapons in outer space, the seas, and, uh, and land. And then later on, we have another one, 1967, what Rania talked about, uh, the Outer Space Treaty, which is now the main or principal treaty governing all activities of states in outer space. And in that same year, we also had the return and rescue agreement, or the agreement that basically says that, you see, if there is an astronaut or a person that goes out, out, out to space and they manage to come back and they are in distress. All countries, all states should try to help them return to their home country. And that also applies to all objects that are launched into space and somehow they land in places they are not supposed to. And that's because space applications are matters of great national importance. Nations attach so much importance to these technologies. No one wants to steal the other's technology. And certainly no one wants their technology stolen. So that's why that particular agreement exists. You know? And then later on in 1974, we have what we call the liability convention. It was realized that, you see, states had started going to space. Uh, by this time, uh, we had had the first man walk on the moon. You know? And, and uh, because of that, there was fear that should there be some kind of conflict in space, how can we solve it? Then the Liability Convention came up. The Liability Convention simply says that um, states are responsible for all activities of all persons that go into space. They can be traced back to what we call the launching state or the appropriate state. So the state that sent you is responsible for every trouble that you cause into space. So that's the, that, that was now the Liability Convention. And then later on, of course, we also have what we call the Registration Convention. The Registration Convention comes on in 1976. And this convention simply says that, you see, uh, how do we register every object that goes to space? We need to keep track of everything. So the Registration Convention simply says, if you're sending something to space, notify all the other states of what you're sending to space so that everyone knows what exactly you've sent there and what it's going to do. And up to today, there is actually a registry with the United Nations Secretary General that details every single object that has ever been sent to space, who sent it, and what it actually is doing there, and when is it supposed to come back, and all that information is in that registration, uh, that, that registry. So later on, of course, with the advent of man on the moon, we now had what we call the agreement of the uh, state's uh, activities on the moon, particularly and other celestial bodies. This has been considered failed, a failed treaty for the simple reason that 
every single, no state actor, no active state actor has ratified it. It only has 18 ratifications and it's considered quite failed. But apart from that, um, I think for me the most successful uh, uh, feature of space uh, activity happened in 1998. Most people look at just these five treaties and for them that's the most important thing. For me the most important happened in 1998. This is when we had uh, five different entities, previously not agreeing, but agreeing for the sake of it to do one miraculous thing. Currently, what we call the International Space Station was the child of that treaty, the, the treaty for the establishment of the Civil International Space Station. This treaty was signed between the United States, Canada, the European Space Agency, Japan, and Russia. The, for the very first time, these five major space actors agreed that let us have a joint project in outer space that is going to benefit every other entity on the planet. The information that is derived from the, uh, from the uh, ISS has been so pivotal to this very same day. The different technologies that we have seen, things like GLONASS, Global, global navigation, navigation System, things like GPS, Global Positioning System, in your car, in your phone, all these things have been as a result of that one single collaboration. And for me, that's one of the biggest wins in space history ever. So um, the other principles, apart from peaceful use, basically the most um, identifying feature, feature is, is, is peace the peace peaceable uses of outer space. But apart from the peaceable uses, we have other different pr uh, priorities, but one of the most important is collaboration. Because space is a very big area, and nations realize that there must be collaboration with each other. And then also information sharing. And this is even more important in contemporary space application. While we have a number of satellites out there, and so much is going on, there needs to be information sharing so that you can prevent accidents in space, you can prevent collisions, and you just generally prevent uh, uh, a bad atmosphere uh, between states. So there is that, whatever. But then also, uh, there is now what we call uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the question of military use. Military use and uh, the question of appropriation. Those are now the two key contemporary areas that are now coming up in space. Military use being, what do we use satellites for? Do we take war to space? You know, that's a big question. And then the second one is appropriation. What happens if someone finds something in space? And a number of states have now come up with national laws. The United States have su has such a law. Luxembourg has such a law. Japan has such a law. Uh, Uganda itself is in the process of having such a law of its own, which governs uh, what do we do when we have a national that, for example, uh, uh, launches, let's say we, we have Elon Musk. Let's say Elon Musk launches a satellite that lands on an asteroid full of diamonds. What happens? Do, uh, does he keep the diamonds for himself? Or does he share them with the entire world? Because the current uh, regime seems to suggest that if you find something in space, share with everyone. You know, but, but the United States and a couple of other states are coming up with something called the Artemis Accords. And these accords are simply saying that, uh -uh, uh, if someone has invested their technology and has invested their knowledge and has invested all this money, space expansion is very expensive. If they find something, let them keep a certain part for themselves. Maybe they can choose to share with the world their findings, but if it's profitable, let them keep it. So those are some of the contemporary areas coming up. Hmm. Um, I think clearly, uh, you know, you've laid out the principles, um, you know, including this idea that uh, international law is beginning to shift from uh, holding space as a common heritage you know, and the whole idea of uh, some nascent uh, privatization beginning to be entertained. But I want to move to uh, my extreme left um, and um, ask the panelist, uh, Philip, to engage further on these national questions, especially based on what Rania said, which was, uh, you know, there is an Africa program now that in line with vision, Africa vision, AU vision 2063, um, 
you know, there is a desire on the part of the continent to develop a space program. Can you, can you take, that, take us down that lane? Thank you very much. Um, well, maybe to start with some of the major things that she mentioned. One, uh, let me first go, let, let me go back to some of the salient issues that she mentioned. She mentioned, she talked about food security, climate change, education, fast urbanization, and security. Some of these issues are the major issues that are, that are affecting us in Africa today. If you, if, 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 if for example, if you, look in, if you look at Uganda today, the, we were making a joke uh, when, when we were having lunch about how locusts are becoming an issue and locating them is becoming an issue. But you realize that behind that issue, when someone, when the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness goes out and makes an announcement and says, we are having a fear that locusts are coming to the country, what are they actually saying? There might be a question of food security. If locusts actually finish everything, what, happen, what happens to the people who have been affected in those areas? So that's the first thing that you have to look at. There are salient features, there are salient issues that she raises that space exploration can actually solve. That's the first thing. Number two, we see that we, we, we don't live, as Africa, we do not live in a bubble. These things have been happening, as, the, as the David had mentioned, they've been happening since the 1950s and 1970s. At what point does Africa wake up and say that, you know what? There's this entire conversation that has been going on about outer space. When do we finally now take a seat at the table and say, you know what, this outer space conversation also affects us. It's necessary. You see so many countries, uh, Uganda, for example, in our vision 2040, we talk, about, we talk about how ICT, information and communication technology, is going to be a major player in achieving the SDGs and the MDGs on top of our own vision 2040. I, how, how, do you, how do you harness ICT and make it better without having, without having space technology being part of this conversation? The multiple uses that it provides, but also, as, as we mentioned earlier, the dangers that are present. You, you, you can imagine when, 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 Russia sends, when, Russia sent, when Russia sent the first, um, the first um, I'm forgetting what they call it. Sputnik. Yeah, Sputnik 1. When they sent Sputnik 1, the very first thing that went on people's minds was, what if the war that we're having down here, the, the arms race, is transferred to space? What happens at that point? So we, as Africa, we realize that we cannot afford to keep quiet anymore. We cannot afford to pretend that we live under a bubble. No, we live in the world just like the rest of us. But also another key thing that we should remember is that in the Outer Space Treaty, it mentions that space is part of the common heritage of all mankind not just a few select individuals who are able to harness it, but all. As portion in that common property, in that global common. That's the thing. That's the question that we start asking. Now at that point, uh, uh, now, now for us, as we try to carve out our space, we have countries like Nigeria that have taken to, that, that have taken to launching their own space stations and saying, you know what, let's have, our own, let's, let's have our own satellites launched into outer space such that we can do what these other countries are doing. You have other countries like South Africa that have opted to share and said, you know what, let us benchmark on these countries that are doing good work and also have space technology. You have things like, you're, you're, in South Africa, for instance, they're having, they're having um, space communication where you have phone calls being bounced not off towers like how we have in Uganda currently, but from satellites abroad, things like that, sp satellites that are in outer space. So we are actually taking a step to realize that we can harness this technology for development and benchmark on people who have done it better than us and grow something in our local capacity. Of course, we may not have the money, we may not have some of all the resources available, the manpower, but if we can benchmark and we say, look, we send a couple of people every year to the International Space Station for internships, we have people learn, studying courses. We, have, we actually have professors. There's a time when we were in South Africa with David and we actually met professors from, from Nigerian universities whose entire brief was space law. And this was amazing. Someone has actually gone to a university and said space law. So you have all these resources. People are now starting to understand that we can do capacity development and with time, we shall actually get there as well. Thank you very much, um, Philip. 
Um, I mean, you've touched quite a number of issues around, uh, you know, around capacity and critical infrastructure and Africa leveraging on its own, you know, on its own competence. I have to tell you, because contrary to what Rania spoke uh, in terms of outlining some of the um, challenges, she mentioned the lack of political goodwill uh, as one of the issues. Um, and she mentioned that uh, there is no commitment on the part of politicians on the continent to give this issue of um, outer space uh, research, uh, to give it a, a primacy of place. But as a matter of fact, if you recall, at the 26th ordinary session of the African Union in January 2016, the AU adopted the Africa space policy and strategy um, as part of its uh, agenda 2063, uh, the aim of that strategy is to revitalize the African, uh, Africa space activities, raise awareness on the role of space science and technology on Africa's socioeconomic development, and mobilize resources for implementation of this policy um, and strategy. Um, you know, following um, you know, that, um, you know, that ad adoption, uh, the, the AU has gone ahead to actually um, um, formulate a treaty um, on outer space, the AU Treaty on outer space, uh, it has not yet come into effect. And one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, will it suffer, you know, the fate of the Moon, um, you know, convention, you know, which was not, which has not received universal ratification or the necessary ratification to actually ensure its full implementation? Will Uganda, for example, ratify this treaty? Um, I know that Egypt um, has offered itself to uh, to be the seat you know, of the Africa um, space Outer Space Agency. Uh, and it's on that basis that several African countries are beginning to establish uh, their own national space uh, agencies, among others. But let's look at um, um, Andrew, and I think it's already been alluded to, the role of, uh, or the place of outer space in advancing telecommunication. I think there is a huge opportunity there, and I just wanted you to you know, speak to that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I agree. There's a huge opportunity in the, in the sphere of telecommunications from outer space. Um, um, outer space affords us an opportunity, number one, to lower the cost of deploying infrastructure for telecommunication. And once that cost is lowered, then communication becomes cheaper. Um, and when communication is cheaper, our, our social interactions, our, our social interventions become cheaper. Um, I'm glad to note that in Uganda, we, had a, we have a company called Uganda Telecom, which many people have sort of forgotten. It was a major player in our telecom sector. And then once the crisis in Libya started, the shareholders couldn't put in any more money and government didn't have money, so it kind of went to sleep. But Uganda Telecom was revamped about a year and a half ago. And one of the first things they have done is look to outer space as a way of catching up with their competitors and possibly even overtaking them. And to that end, they have signed um, an agreement with an international company. It's, it's, it's a startup called ASX. And what ASX does is it launches these communication satellites into space, outer space. And the beauty with those satellites is that UTL will have, Uganda Telecom will have access to these satellites. And so for the first time in our telecom space, Uganda will have 100% telecommunication coverage. So we are looking forward to that. So that is, th that is the beauty with outer space best telecom infrastructure, if I might put it. Um, for Africa, I think we have no choice. We have to look to outer space. We are a very, very young continent, and we're looking for, opportuni for opportunities within this competitive world. And telecommunications is one of those sectors that will enable our young people be able to be creative and innovative within the ICT space. If we're going to talk about, for example, e-commerce. E-commerce is now a fancy term currently. It's just a fancy term only understood by a few of the urbanites. And one of the reasons why that is, is because it is not, it is not, 
in the West, they say it's cheap to have an e-commerce platform. It's easy to, to buy your things online. But in Uganda and in most places of Africa, it's still expensive. Um, we have a gigabyte of data in Uganda costing 5,000 shillings a day. So if I'm somebody who is going to be buying and trading online, uh, I might not be able to afford that because once I accumulate that cost per year, it's quite prohibitive. So outer base satellites, uh, telecom satellites, um, they will help us in that by lowering the cost of telecommunication, the cost of getting onto an e-platform, as an example, will be much lowered and will afford opportunities to our younger people. Thank you. I thought Andrew deserves a clap right there because if the cost of data, you know, if, if, if leveraging on, uh, on, on, on space science can be able to impact on the cost of data, um, I think that's a huge thing, especially for a, for a young economy and a youthful uh, economy such as, uh, such as Uganda. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's that good time when um, we want to entertain, you know, your own um, intervention. And so I want to invite as many of us as have questions. We have about 30 minutes um, to, um, to respond to your questions. I hope there is a mic around that can, can be given to persons who have questions. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation, guys. My name is Kea Nicholas. Um, my worry happens to be the way we do politics. <laughs> and with that, it's the question of patronage. So across Africa, for the longest time, the way we do politics is so-and-so gets an edge over other Africans because they're next to the boss and their families loot the land, they loot the resources, and they pass the baton on to their generations. Now, it's a type of politics that creates a big debt within our own populations, even in the future. So whilst we're having a conversation about space, the conversation about our own telecommunications and uh, internet is already in question because of the same thing the way we play politics, our patronage economies, make it so that it's impossible to actually leverage our own civil populations to actually create solutions because the people in power are not willing to trust their own citizens. Mm -hmm. They'd rather trust their own sons and daughters, which doesn't work. For example, if you take a look at, if we are discussing space, let's take a look at the Ugandan airport. Now, they signed a contract that in effect puts Uganda at the back foot of its own travel in, in the air. If we have any queries, we have to go all the way to China to sort that out. It's a similar pattern with other contracts a lot of Ugandan officials sign. For example, I am an artist. The, the contracts the UPRS, the Uganda Performing Rights Society, signed with third parties are exactly the same, meaning our politicians have no idea what they're doing. They're just in it to steal. Yeah. They don't I, get, I get your point. I get your point, uh, Kea. Yeah. Um, so two questions I think is posed, which is, you know, might our focus or might our developments around outer space exacerbate existing inequality? Okay? And then how can we make whatever we are doing in the area of science and technology and innovation, uh, how can we make it more open and transparent? You know, how can we make contracts? You know, for example, the contract you alluded to, you know, which is a great thing for the country. Uh, is it possible for citizens to be aware exactly who are these players who are behind this exciting venture that is going to bring benefit to the country? So those are two questions that I think I would want you to respond to. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. And then we'll come right here. Thank you so much. Uh, Kenneth Jowar, I'm a lawyer. I'm a human rights, and a human rights activist working with Legal of Uganda. Sp speak up, sir. Yeah, so uh, my issue, my, I have two questions. The first thing is understanding the principle of land law. The law says if you own land, you own with everything beneath it, at the bottom, and to the space. That's what the law says. And it's a, it's a Latin maxim. So, but the next issue goes is, what is the limit beneath and above? What is the level of interruption above and interruption beneath? That's one thing we need to talk about. 
Then secondly, I want to bring an illustration of the Concord, Air, the Concord plane, how dangerous it was. This is a plane that is twice faster than its sound. And a Concord just flies over my house and you know what to leave behind. My, if my kids are playing on their toys, they can fall. That's assume me if I have kids, but I don't have them now. But the issue is, I like what the world did in trying to make sure Concord was put down. Then I would, my next issue would be in that regard, what does the law in place have to do with such interference? In law, we call it nuisance. How are we looking at the level of nuisance above the, in the space? Because uh, the two colleagues of mine, they are lawyers, and they understand what is in rail and versus Fletcher, which is not addressed by what is in space. Then my next issue is in regards to the militarization of the space. Just not far from us here, we have the control center of the, of the drones in Djibouti, where the United States have their drones flying all over and we don't know. One may even be here, we don't know. It's hidden into the, into the clouds, we don't know. Uh, I would like to know, what is it being done about the unfairness of the militarization of the drones? Because we saw the impact in Libya, how dangerous it was. With that, with that airstrike that was given to, that was over Kondom, the late Condom Muammar Gaddafi, and such things that are being done to militarize the military supremacy against the other weak states in the space. Thank so you. I would like those to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I think very clear questions around externalities. How do you deal with externalities uh, that surround the development or the use of outer space? And, and I think it links all the way to the question of outer space debris, you know, among other questions. And then, again, he comes back to the question of militarization um, and inquires there on drone technology. What's, what's the relationship between this conversation we're having and, you know, and, and a bit of drone technology? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good afternoon. So mine um, came from two issues that arose when the panelists were discussing. Philip talked about territorial airspace, and I think Kasibante mentioned something to do with appropriation of discoveries in the outer space. So it got me, got me thinking, um, are we going to have a scramble and petition of the outer space as well by these countries that are going ahead of us because they can afford it, just like we had in Africa years back? Question, I think. New colonialism by the Martians. <laughs> Somebody else. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm called Kofsinja Winmi, uh, Vice President, called College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Makere University. I only have one question to ask. I would like to understand how gender is going to be integrated in this space. Because according to Africa, if we can check out in the social, economic, and political spheres, we realize or we see that uh, gender has not been um, integrated in them. It has been, but not to their needed uh, uh, capacity. So I'd like to understand how you have prepared or how you have integrated gender in this space. How are men going to enjoy equally like women in this space? How would like to understand? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. I think a very clear question. There were two, so the, the lady and the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Patrick, and uh, mine is uh, is more like what what Mark Mott said there, Council Mark Mott. I think Africa. I always I always tell my friends that that that. Some of our countries, like my, my country, Uganda here, we're living in about 1700 today. If, if, just imagine you snapped a finger and everything we, we import in this room disappeared. How many of us would be naked? So uh, I, I think it's good for our governments to talk about going to space, building all these vessels and, and equipment. But first, I would like us to, to sit back and use what is already existing. Like uh, David says, in 1998, there was a convention that gave rise to the ISS, the International Space Station, that, that, that through which the big five give us access to a technology such as GPS. 
Personally, I'm an agriculturalist, and I use GPS to literally do everything. I can measure the width of this room using my phone. I can draw the map using my phone. I can tell what's beneath the ground, where is dry, where is stony, where, where, where is well draining, where is not. I decide where to put my crops. Have we done that before we talk about going to space? But it's not really skepticism because he's saying there is already so much that we can leverage on, but we are not, all right? Uh, and he's talking about GPS, which, which is an application that could not have been possible without, um, you know, without engagement with, uh, with, with the outer space. Um, and so you need to persuade Patrick you know, that, uh, that this venture is worth it. Okay, madam. Thank you so much. Uh, just to also supplement on what he was talking about, in 1970, uh, President Amin by then made something called uh, the Poma Earth Statelite Dish. I think it's, it's something that we have as a government or as a nation. And I, I don't know, BSJ, you said you're with the Ministry of ICT, if I got you well. Uh, I think this could also be a place where we would exploit more because if we use this as a, one of the bases that we can start from, it can help on internet connectivity in relation to the brand with, band we did in this section. But I find if you go through that route as you're going and passing it, the Poma route, the place is really isolated, and I don't know if the government is doing any kind of maintenance on this. I think we could also look into this. And also in relation to the fact that one of the panelists spoke about uh, minerals that are being mined out. So where does that leave us as Africa, really, as Uganda? Is there anything we are doing in such a state of, like, ICT, wh where is it leaving us? Are other people advancing as Uganda? We are not going to benefit in any of these resources. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think we'll take those as the first round of questions. Um, she's talking about critical infrastructure. We'll come back to you. Those are the many questions. I think they're very comprehensive questions, uh, a testament to how, uh, you know, how attentive our, our audience is. And so I want to invite the panelists to take it um, you know, from there. We can start with you, David. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just run quickly through uh, the questions so that we can uh, go ahead. So um, for some, I think I'll let my uh, fellow uh, panelists handle. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll handle the ones that are uh, well within my docket. Uh, so the, 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 first, the first question that I'm going to handle uh, is uh, that was asked by Mr. Kennedy, the principles uh, of, of, of land law, uh, what is above and what is below and what are the, li the limitations. Uh, uh, maybe what I hadn't uh, explained in the beginning is that uh, uh, the, 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 oh, the corpus of space law or the body of space law is uh, governed by international law and it's not governed by national laws. And that is why Mr. Victor uh, McMott mentioned earlier that uh, there is a certain space where if you pass that area, you have left your national boundaries and everything that happens above that is now international. So in 1967, that was agreed upon by all states uh, that um, anything in outer space will be out of national boundaries. So outer space is one of those places we call places beyond national jurisdiction. That means you cannot express any rights in outer space. And, and there's, there have been attempts in 1976, there was uh, what we call the Bogota Declaration, where a couple of states which are located on the equator tried to express, um, uh, they tried to express ownership of what we call the geostationary orbit, which is about, uh, give or take, uh, 33,000 uh, you know, kilometers above uh, the equator. But they failed to uh, justify that, and the declaration itself failed in its, in its own whatever. So when it comes to space, anything that is above the common line is totally out of national jurisdiction. So there, all states have all rights to do whatever they want to do in that particular area. And then you mentioned something about nuisance, uh, you know, uh, disturbances. And, and he, I remember a uh, uh, doctor talked about uh, uh, debris. There are rules in international law, especially in space law, that govern debris. Currently, the, under the United Nations, we have what we call the debris mitigation guidelines, which are basically aimed at helping states mitigate this debris. That 
remember what I mentioned about the liability convention. If any state does anything in space that is going to uh, harm the interests of another state, then the state that has caused the harm is internationally liable for that damage, and it's supposed to pay for it. If you remember when uh, India launched an anti-satellite uh, an anti missile last year, there was widespread um, uh, uh, anger, uh, anger all over the world, and India was actually put to the test and it was tasked with cleaning up that debris because it affects the rights of all the other states to and use where would, where would, space. Who would adjudicate that dispute? Now, the, 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 the international fora, the international fora for, for mitigation of, of such problems, and uh, for example, there are arbitral tribunals that states can set up. A state that is injured can set up a tribunal with another uh, within the international framework, and then also we have the International Court of Justice. Un unfortunately, we have not yet had any case in space related in the International Court of Justice, but we have had arbitral uh, tribunal cases that have come up uh, that have been decided by these tribunals to solve some of these issues. And then you mentioned drones. I think that has been answered, the fact that drones are within airspace, so they are purely governed by national law. If there is a problem with drones, then the state in whose airspace these drones operate should be able to take that up uh, with all the other states. Then um, someone mentioned about the scramble and partition. I didn't get your name quite well, but the scramble and partition in space there is, there is a fear, of course, that the states that have, they have it all are going to, you know, uh, take it all. But in 1996, we had uh, the declaration on the, in, on the activities in states taking into, um, taking into uh, accordance the interests of developing states. This was 1996, where states came up, the, the United Nations General Assembly decided that all the states that have the capacity should be able to share what they have with developing states. And this has actually happened in Africa. Uh, we have had uh, 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 collaborations between the have-its and uh, the have-nots. Currently, Uganda has three students in Japan currently undertaking their studies in space uh, robotics and space sciences, and uh, they are supposed to basically come back and do capacity building. So their, their efforts, uh, some states are really trying to reach out and help the developing world uh, in this particular area. I think this also will answer the question of appropriation. Where does appropriation leave us? You know, if someone gets something in space, how does it help us? You know, so there are frameworks where uh, the, the international community is agreeing that if someone finds something in space, they should be able to share with whoever wishes to have a share in that thing. If not the thing itself, at least the information, the technology, these things to, to help everyone reach an equity in space. Which then leads me to the question of gender. What happens uh, with gender, the, the problem of gender, we currently have a, a program under the, the African Union uh, to, exp uh, to expand uh, what we call gender equity in space. And uh, the, United, uh, the United UN Women has a whole program on uh, mentorship uh, where we have uh, Rania Tukibri herself is a UN uh, mentor uh, in, in women, uh, mentoring women and girls in space related activities. So of course we are not entirely there because uh, the journey is really not the destination, but there is trial, there is efforts to help uh, uplift women and girls in STEM activities. Myself, I run a program just dedicated entirely to that, to see that there are girls and women who are actually taking up some of these spaces. Because, I mean, someone mentioned earlier that educate a woman and educate a nation. So that's something that is also David. been uh, taken up in Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Mm. Uh, let's, let's hear from Andrew. Um, thank you, Doctor. Um, let me first address the issue of militarization of space. What is being Sadly, we can't run away from that. Um, as you are aware, early this week, the Chinese launched something called a hypersonic missile. This goes way into outer space, so you could, the idea is you can launch it from here, go into outer space, re-enter the Earth's surface, and hit New York, travel, traveling at many, 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 many times the, sound, the, the speed of sound. So we can't really run away from that. However, um, yeah, so that has given rise to a new um, weapons race. So this weapons race is primarily between the Americans, the Chinese, and the Russians. 
So the way the world is funny, the Americans have money and the technical know-how how to build these weapons. The Chinese have the money, but they have not yet found the technical know-how. The Russians have the technical know-how, but they don't have the money. Now, sadly, in Africa, we are struggling to find the technical know-how and the finances. <laughs> so these are the realities we have to contend with. So we can't run away from militarization of space. You are aware one of the first things Donald Trump did when he was president was set up a space army. It is why um, somebody spoke about our politicians doing nothing, and I would, I would like to ask you, please, don't allow your anger to, to blind you to certain realities. Our politicians are not doing nothing. We might disagree with them on certain things and agree with them on other things. One of the things they are doing correctly is, as Dr. had said, is find modalities as Africa of utilizing outer space for, among others, our own defense as Africa. And I think for me that is commendable. One of the countries they are looking to is Uganda, precisely because we are located at the equator. So this is why there's quite a bit of money coming in now into Uganda's space program. In Kenya, they have a space program. And these people are doing so many things to try and help us catch up. Maybe even if we get lucky, leapfrog. So they are not doing nothing. So um, that is one. Um, does the science, space science, favor all, or is it for a select few? Um, I'll ask you this. Does the internet favor few, or it favors all? For as long as you have access, it will favor you. The critical thing here is getting access. When the internet was first launched, it's, it was only in America and in a few capitals of the West. Even in Japan, it wasn't there so much. It was primarily in, the, in North America and in a few European capitals. But now, even when you go to Chakahunga or Okere, you'll find internet. So it will favor all, eventually. Um, yes, to the young lady, you asked me about Mpoma. Yes, Mpoma was, was built by Idi Amin in the early 70s. It, it was built using the technology of that time. Starting next year, I'll tell you, the starting next year, government of Uganda is building a brand new facility to replace the one of Mpoma. So this will be an Earth observation facility. So government is not sleeping, it's doing something. So hopefully we'll be able to reap the rewards of that facility. Currently, the one at Mpoma, we can't use it because its technology is now yesterday, last millennium. So we're now trying to do one of this millennium. Yeah. Agriculture, yeah. Um, you're right, we have, we have so many technologies that we can use on Earth. We have so much to do here. But again, still, I think that is not an excuse for us not to find opportunities in outer space. You grab your opportunity when you can and why you can. It, we're not going to see the whole world um, getting into space and we're comfortable on Earth and think that we shall remain like that. The world will change and leave us. People, I'll give you a, a hypothetical example. If somebody found that you could grow plants at a quarter of the price you do on Earth and grow them on Mars, how are you going to compete with that person? So you take your opportunities where you can, and space is a very good frontier for us to explore. So the, the most important thing for us here is to build capacity to be able to explore this frontier and maximize it for the benefit of Africa and all humanity. Let us not, re let us not forget that Africa is part of humanity. Yes, our, our history sometimes, we have paid a heavy price for being, uh, for being a bit lackluster or being too, uh, being too trusting, but the world has changed. Africans are educated, Africans are in Washington, they're in Tokyo, they're in Berlin, they're in Portugal, they're even in Durban. So let's, let's have hope, let's, let's each, encourage each other to, I encourage you to join Casibante's program, for example, and see what he can do. You never know, you'd be the next Elon Musk and you'd have your own Dragon X and you'll be, you'll be taking people to outer space to take pictures of Earth and they'll be paying you millions of dollars. Good business sense for you, good business sense for Uganda, good business sense for Africa, and you'll have learned something. Thank you.
Thank you, Doctor. Um, let me just run through the questions quickly. Uh, there was a question from Nicholas about uh, how this innovation and technology would excavate uh, income inequalities and things like that. Uh, usually, my understanding of technology is that technologies are political, in that it's not, it doesn't have a political party, it does not have a face, it is innovation comes in where it finds a gap. There's a gap that is, there's a gap that needs to be filled and people innovate in order to fill that gap. So space technology in this particular case, it is literally anyone's oyster. If you wake up tomorrow and you have an innovation, that is actually going to solve the problem and help Uganda move one step closer to putting a Ugandan on the moon, then definitely. You just, there are certain things that they transcend the realm of politics and certain things like that. You, you, sometimes you need to, you need to depoliticize some of these, some of these issues. They are, especially in things like technology. I know we, our country has a history of trying to politicize certain things. Currently, we're having an issue with the internet and that, but you see, eventually, the internet also takes its day. They had to get a point where OTT was removed and people had actually got to get access to the internet. So, technologies are political and I don't think issues like patronage, especially with space exploration, would become an issue. Provided someone has the capacity and has built capacity, you will be able to, you, you'll be able to transcend some of these barriers. Uh, the, the other question was by Kennedy. When he was talking about the dangers, he mentioned Concord and all these other things. Again, the beauty with, the beauty with space regulation eh, is that it transcends national law. It's international law. The fundamental principle underlying international law is pacta sunt savanda. What means, well, what, 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 when you translate it to, when you translate it, it means that agreements are meant to be kept. So the fundamental, the fundamental aspect underlying all those space treaties is that countries have come together as independent states and agreed that we are going to be governed by certain principles when exploring space. So the fact that there's agreement on some of these things, you know that there's a consensus and Uganda has as much right as USA to say that, you know what, that does not favor us, we choose not to be bound by that. So that's the advantage that comes with that. Uh, and plus also the general regulation, I mean, you mentioned Concord. It was not allowed to fly Concord over at supersonic speed over the general population. You could only fly at supersonic speed over water. There were clear guidelines and instructions. And same thing with space. There's a clear body of law that details each and every one of the scenarios, including how to deal with debris. My colleague Kasibante noted that. Which brings me to the other question from Caro about scramble and partition. Again, goes back, goes back to that initial statement. Agreements are to be kept. If states come together and agree that we are going to be governed by a certain corpus of law, and we agree that these are the laws that are going to govern how we interact with each other in space and on space issues, then unless otherwise, unless otherwise you, you may not have an issue. Because at that table, all countries are, all countries are meeting as equals, more or less despite economic disparities and all those things, you meet as equals. That's why when, when, when David talks about the treaty that was not ratified in, 19, in, in 1998, it, it literally failed, collapsed on its face because other people said, you know what, this does not work. Other states came together and said that does not work and they let it be and it's now totally not ratified. So when you have a body of law that is built on consensus, eh, the laws are just not imposed on people. There's there's a deliberation process that allows people to come together and agree. Uh, which brings me to the other question, the gender equity issue. True, there is a problem, but there are steps being taken. There are steps being taken to actually mitigate it, deliberate steps to ensure that women also have a seat at the table. I, if you notice the first, the presentation that was made to us was made by a lady, and she clearly mentioned that UN Women actually has a whole program encouraging women to get involved in space activities. So it's deliberate, There's n they have noticed that there is a gap, and they're taking deliberate steps to fill it. Uh, the other question I think was by Patrick, about leveraging already existing technology. I believe, I believe yes, we need to leverage on already existing technology, but how do we do that? People have already broken the barrier for us and given us these innovations that we have today. 
if we can build on top of that foundation, we don't necessarily have to go to ground zero. If someone has built to a certain extent and said, we have built capacity to this extent, this is so far what we have done. Can you now run with it and continue? Can you now run with it and continue? Okay, so now you've seen that GPS has allowed you to you know, map out a place and see which place has water, which place has can we build? Can we now build from that and say, look, in Africa, we have a problem of ever-changing weather conditions. Can we now build on that and ask, can we build an application that harnesses GPS technology to actually help us better predict the weather, the, the weather and climate and things like that? Because it is an issue. So let's build on what's, let's not, let's not, let's not take away the achievements that have been made. Let us build on them and do better. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I feel like the message to take home from this panel is that notwithstanding the geopolitics of um, outer space, Africa has taken the view that it will not be left behind. And so I believe there is an opportunity for all of us uh, to engage and to leverage as individuals, as corporations, and as states. Um, as Shakespeare says in King Henry V, the reeds are tied in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, but omitted. All the voyage of their lives is bound in shallows and in misery, and on such sea are we now afloat and must take our turn while it serves. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, why should we care about space? The simple reason is it is not going anywhere. It is there, and someone else is caring about it in a manner that is even more beneficial to us. Uganda has so much benefit from space, so much. Being an 80% agrarian country, first of all, we have the question of uh, farming, seasons. Who is going to predict the seasons? Who is going to help the farmers? Who is going to help the people who are driving the cars, the GPS? Who is going to look at all those aspects? The truth is, some other countries are using the resource that we also have and are using them in a manner that is more than we're using them. The example is China, for example. China has satellites that are simply dedicated to monitoring the seasons for rice planting. China does not have a food security problem. Uganda does. So if Uganda could leverage space technology and space applications, because the atmosphere and just Earth here, it's very limited. There are so many opportunities that can be gotten from outside the Earth's atmosphere. And it's those, those opportunities that we need to leverage in order to solve the problems that we have on the ground here. And that's why every Ugandan should be concerned that we do not have a space agency, that we do not have a satellite. That we, Where have we been when other states are actually doing the exact same thing and ripping a hundred times more than any other? So that's why we should be bothered. I, I think it's very important that we understand this. Simply because there are problems on the ground does not mean that we cannot care about anything else. Simply because we have problems with potholes does not mean that we should not have the national airline. There is an issue of interoperability. Problems don't come one. Problem, problems come in pairs. If you're going to simply re, uh, uh, look at one problem and not the other, you're going to find yourself that this second problem is going to grow so much that by the time you're done with the first problem, the second has grown way too high. So let's look at Uganda and space. Yes, it's true that we have problems down on the ground, but these problems can actually be solved by solutions from above. And that is exactly why we should try. We have tried everything on the ground. We have tried everything. So how about we try some new methods of work? How about we look at new ways of doing things? If the first way fails, let's look elsewhere. And, and that's the importance of space. So it does not negate the fact that we have problems. We have corruption. We have bad roads. 
we, we just we have a, a city that smells. But the truth is, all these problems can be solved with simple space applications. All of them. They can actually be solved by simple space applications. And if these applications do not entirely solve the problem, they will help give us different perspectives on how to solve these problems. So the person that never tried never got the solution. So how about we try a different arena all together and try to get a solution from there. We need more conversations uh, like the geopolitics conference. We need more people involved. We need to have these conversations. I have been the national point of contact for Uganda for about a year now uh, for this SGSC. And in this entire period, I have struggled to find spaces in which we can discuss these ideas. Uh, most of the spaces I've gotten have actually been off the continent. Interestingly, off the continent, there is so much interest in such activities. I was recently addressing the United Nations uh, Security Council and uh, Columbia University over the same thing that I'm addressing uh, 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 Uganda right now with. And the thing is, it is easier in those arenas. It's easier to access these uh, talks. It's easier to be, uh, to be invited to speak at the United Nations. But our own countries do not think it's very important. Firstly, Africa, one of the main reasons why we're lagging behind is because we don't have the money. The money that's needed for most of these things is not available. So how about we change, a, we change tactics? And we say, you see, if there is no money, how about we come together, collaborate, and we come up with something? This effort has already been promulgated. Currently, we have uh, the Roscom satellites. There are three satellites that were launched by different African states coming together and launching these satellites basically to help in telecommunications. On the 25th of October, just last month, uh, Uganda, Kenya, and Egypt won uh, a collaborative effort with, uh, with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, which is mainly going to help Uganda, Kenya, and Egypt develop a camera that will be put on the International Space Station which camera is going to help monitor weather patterns, soil, and that kind of geospatial monitoring. So you see how collaboration helps. So when we fail as one, how about we come together? We have a number of nations and states and entities coming together, pulling resources and bargaining together and coming up with joint projects. The European Union is doing this very perfectly with the European Space Agency very perfectly. Currently, they have so many projects in outer space, but not one single European state you can point at that has a particular project. All of them are put together under the European Space Agency, and they are making so much progress. So, so how about Africa does that? If Uganda is not able to do it on its own, how about we team with Kenya, you know, come up with something joint, and then it helps both of us. So I think that would be a much more practical way of doing things. Uh, my dream destination is the nearest star to our solar system, the Proxima Centauri. It's about 10,000 light years away. And uh, for me, that's, it's, it's a very big fascination because uh, it poses one of the biggest points of curiosity in the universe, you know? Uh, I, I, would, I think I would love to see it with my own eyes, but then also I think I'd like to see a bit of quasars and uh, I'd like to see a nebula. You know, so those are some of the other destinations. Space is very wonderful. It has so much, so much wonder. So I think really any of these places would be my destination.